Uh, oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's out the hallway. Okay. Uh, he was on the phone. Special. Okay. So we can find you in the dark. Okay. Phil said, so we can find you in the dark. Okay. Phil's under. Come to town. Y'all got blood and everything. This is back in class. And he's still at the park. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's uh, <clears throat> 10 a.m. on February 13, 2024. Call the Port Authority Advisory Committee meeting uh, to order. We'll start with a roll call of PAC members and we'll kind of let the roll call double as an introduction. And so when I call your name, please instead raise your hand, Jesse. You know, we have a couple of PAC members virtually, I see. So, uh, Roger Duncan? Here. Uh, Charles Houseman? Here. Charles Allen? All right. Zach Johnson? 
Here, Goshen. Here. Roger Reese. Here. Bill Sethal. Here. Walker Smith. Here. <clears throat> John Stavik. Here. And Chris Fisher. I'm here. All right. Form. Uh, I'd like to also follow up and allow for Gare to introduce his TxDOT staff. Can we do a quick, where's Cam? Okay. Just Maybe. a quick introduction about like, the okay. 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 Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Port Houston. Um, in terms of safety, if we have any issues um, with, you know, fire alarms, any, anything like that goes off, we do have stairs over here back to the right. Um, so take those down, four flights, go for the floor. Um, also, we do have a boat tour availability coming up um, after this meeting. So we did have a tour already scheduled with our environmental team um, with the Rice Institute for Energy. So we are going to join them on that tour. Um, so I think folks signed up ahead of time for that for availability. So find me, I'll help you get there at the end of, end of this meeting. Thanks, Cam. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'd like to introduce the uh, maritime division attendees here in the room. We have Travis Milner, our planning and development section director, Chris Noll, our pro port program coordinator, Kristen Sass, our business operations project manager, and Erica Campo is a program coordinator, and Emily Schubauer was a program coordinator. Um, also. We are uh, fortunate enough to have Carolyn Mays here today as well, who is the director of planning and modal programs, and myself, Gary Kelly, with Maritime Division. So thank you for looking forward to a very productive meeting. Thank you, Gary. Item number three, guidance on virtual, virtual meeting participation. So I know we do have a couple of PAC members that are uh, participating virtually. So please, if you are a back member participating virtually on any voting items, please make sure you're on camera and I can see both our back members are participating virtually now. Uh, yeah. Also, uh, for those in the room and virtually, there will be a, a, a time for a public comment on each action item. So we'll be a, a public comment will be allowed uh, during that period of time for each action item. So opening remarks, uh, we do have a, a few items uh, will be voted on today. Uh, some information has been presented just for uh, discussion purposes. Uh, as no public will be able to comment on any any. Uh, Items that we have uh, today, and uh, Roger, appreciate you hosting us today. Appreciate the safety in information. If you have any other comments? But no, we're know. glad to host. Uh, we can uh, I, I certainly jump on the opportunity. We can host here again next time if you like to. It's just uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's the first time that I recall that we this meeting here we're glad to do it and uh, uh just can't mention the boat tour that that boat tour we were able to accommodate but there was already one book that's in high demand but i think it might be a good group to collaborate with anyway with the baker institute there as well so we'll have a few folks on there uh, from our infrastructure group and uh, also and uh, uh, some of our other community relations people or whatever so what we're going is uh, as Scam said, he'll get you there. Uh, we'll have direction this after. It's easy to get to. But uh, anyway, glad you're here. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. And when we do have voting items, please note that only PAC members are allowed to vote. So. <laughs> All righty. Item number five. Approval of the meeting minutes from the November 14th and December 12th, 2023 
uh, meetings. Uh, Emily has distributed the uh, minutes uh, for PAC members to review. Take a couple more minutes if needed. Uh, but does anybody have any both revisions or want to make a motion for approval? Second, okay. Walker Smith is, uh, made the motion and second, Sean. Sean seconded. Okay. Any uh, public discussion or any public comments on the meeting minutes? Okay, hearing none, call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed to the meeting? Item six is update on the Port Authority Advisory Committee meeting recording. I'll take that one. Um, so we're moving forward with transitioning into uh, video recordings being available after the, the PAC meetings, and uh, hopefully, we'll get to a point where that takes away the need to provide many updates. So, anybody who has any questions, we just I think officially this is our first meeting that we will not have meeting minutes to uh, for for the pack to approve moving forward. We'll be using the video recording as our meeting minute. So, and it's important to note that the meeting itself, the recording will be on PikeStock.gov, so you can access it anytime. A little bit more expedient matter to. Assist with some sort of this technology, but I'd like to hear from the pack also if there's any concerns about moving to search. And I think just to support that, I think Emily's been working with our with our IT and creative services group to make the video. I don't know that it'll happen for this this one, but moving forward, we're hoping that the agenda items. You'll be able to click on the agenda and it would take you to that portion of the video. So you wouldn't have to watch the entire video to get what you're looking for. So yeah, but we're going to work hard for this time, guys, but it's in process. Yeah. <laughs> that works well. That's the way the Transportation Commission exactly yeah. recordings are. And so it's very helpful. Okay. That was it. All right. Very good. Item number seven, update on tech stock maritime projects. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Um, happy to be here to uh, kind of give you an update on the funding that was provided during the 88 session. Uh, got a table up here that gives a short um, kind of summary of where we're at today. So um, I'm not going to go into the numbers, but Needless to say, we're moving in the right direction um, in terms of the maritime infrastructure. Um, you know, we've already got seven contracts executed. Actually, Houston's under construction already, so great job. Um, and still working on the seaport connectivity. Um, so just, I think, to note here, all, all projects uh, in terms of the maritime infrastructure still appear to be on track for 2024 planning. So that's great news. Um, and I think on that note, we know the challenges. We know the information requests have been a lot from you all, so we really appreciate you being supportive and, and collaborating with us and being patient and providing what's necessary to get these things on the ground. So, uh, you know, I think this continued collaboration is going to help us be successful in the end. Um, okay, so in terms of the schedule, you know, we're, we are uh, we need to be kept apprised of any updates. So please, you know, be sure to communicate any changes to that schedule. Um, that is what we're using to base. If we get information requests, that's what we are using your schedule to communicate for. So if something changes, please uh, reach out. Um, obviously, the focus to date has really been the infrastructure projects because we're trying to get those out um, in FY24. But um, but we've received everything to, for the most part. We've received everything we need for the infrastructure projects that now the, the focus will now be on those connectivity projects. So, you know, please be mindful. Um, any information requests for 2024 SCP projects, the connectivity projects, please, uh, please get that to us by March 1st. 
And for 2025 projects, um, we're shooting for May 1st on those. Just a couple notes to as informational. We anticipate a formal request um, in the near future from the leg legislature to provide a, a report on um, kind of funding progress and compliance to date. So just um, keep that in mind. Uh, but like I said, everything seems to be we appear to be on the right track. Um, and then one other note. So the the, the last bullet here. One of the things that we are trying to do, or, or at least um, preparing ourselves for, is to develop an educational, um, some educational materials later in the year, um, hopefully for distribution to legislature on, um, and this will very likely be a visual aid, and it's outlining project progress. More or less what, what we're trying to show is, you know, what, where did we start with, and where did we end up with, with the funding? And so obviously there's gonna be projects that are, that are in their early phases by mid summer, early fall, but but there's going to be others that will be progressed long enough to where visually it, it, it would be impactful. So all that's to say is if you're out there, um, any drone footage, any photography, any visual capturing of, of your progress, um, please share that with us because again, the idea then is that we consolidate that information in the settings. So the last, we talked about connectivity, we talked about infrastructure. The last bucket is the ship channel improvement. A provider, um, legislature provided $40 million in an account to provide low interest loans to, um, to professionally authorized ship channel projects. Uh, we have worked through the textile administration, uh, textile commission to the terms up on the board are um, are the approved terms for the program. So zero to three years, um, no interest or payments, um, in, at least until construction or or that uh, that three year time period comes to term. Then the middle ground, three to five years, you're looking at an interest rate um, AAA minus one for five out of its market rate. So we are continuing efforts to communicate this and, and should try to garner interest in the program, but today we've received no applications. Uh, so please you know, reach out uh, to anyone that you can to garner interest in the program. Um, but I think it's I think it's something to be mindful of that at this point. Uh, this is our, our reality. So with that, oh, one thing I failed to mention, um, can we go back one slide? So off to the right, uh, the application is available online, um, and but you can also email it to that Texas scurf at txd.gov, uh, and then there's a physical mailing address down at the bottom as well. Uh, any questions? Just add one thing to the scurf. Like, yeah. okay, so if you've, had, if you've had funding previous for a project, you can't utilize this fund to refinance that because it's a better. It's a better thing. Good point. Yeah, get clarity on that. I think it's as accessible as possible. Yeah. Uh, any, uh, is there any questions, Mr. Miller, or comments regarding his presentation? Thank you, Travis. Appreciate it very much. Item number eight approval of Texas Fort list. This is an action item uh, we voted on. Uh, Emily has provided a listing of 23 ports uh, to be considered and, uh, and our navigation districts uh, to be considered for approval. Uh, there has also been discussed, I think, in the work session and also information provided to the Ports Association generally about the definition uh, of Texas Force. Now, we're not voting on the definition. We discuss the definition, but that's the thought process of getting to the listing of the 23 boards. So, um, with that, we'll open it up for uh, discussion and, and thoughts regarding um, either item of definition that we are, the basis that we use to get to the 23 boards, any information, and then at some point, we'll. 
motion after the discussion. I think there might be some discussion. So. Officer discussion. All right, so we'll entertain the motion uh, consideration of approval for the 23 points as presented. Motion by Roger Reese. We have a second. A second. Second by Walker Smith. All right. Um, any public comment regarding the uh, listing of 23 ports for approval? Just want to add that we did have this conversation with the governor's office and the economic development. Uh, they're on, on board with this. And uh, it's glad to get to a point where we can all agree on, on these ports. <laughs> we haven't said that. Commercial and, and, I mean, who is not on that list? I mean, is there some ports that are just not meeting the definition that are excluded? I think for all publicly owned ports, that I think the list is pretty comprehensive and pretty inclusive. Publicly owned single family homes. Right. According to our definition. Yes. Yeah. All right, so we have a motion and a second. So uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Right, is there any opposed? All right, the board listing of 23 forts is presented and passes unanimously. Okay. Item number nine. Uh, proposal and approval of minimum legislative charge. Uh, this is an action item, and I know this has been uh, discussed some with the, with the uh, PAC, and then also I know TPA has done some work with this. Uh, so as an advisory committee to the text doc, it's certainly appropriate that uh, uh, we review this and consider uh, passage of this. Uh, it certainly uh, the I think the uh, wording that's been pro that was provided to you just for your starting point information is from the Texas Ports Association. We have no obligation to approve that uh, as is or anything like that. So uh, I think there may be some discussion or comment on this, how we feel like maybe this should be fine to tweak a little bit. So uh, with that, uh, is there any discussion on this, on this item? Uh, I, I have some discussion. Um, yes, I, uh, this this is Roger Gunther. There was some uh, discussion about this in the TPA, and uh, the uh, understanding the general the charge of having a copy of it. And uh, yeah, I, I express these concerns um, about you know what this actually means. It seemed kind of superficial to me uh, about what. Well, Asking to do the first, you know, to a comment, analyze our recent investments. I don't know what that means because, you know, investments that are ongoing, they haven't, they're not going to be in place, you know, discussing the impact. I, I get it, you know, hey, we're very appreciative of this, but I've been pretty vocal about the fact that, you know, the, the importance that we've seen, and I know there's a, a scurf funding recommendation up there. And as I read through, you know, chapter 55 and what we're charged with, what this body is, uh, that is, uh, you know, gives the authority to this body or whatever, sure, uh, it, it can't be just centric on port facilities. You know, it talks about port development infrastructure and projects, which will improve the security of movement and intermodal transportation cargo. I'm okay. out of text dot here, and if we don't somehow highlight the importance of moving freight to and from our ports and just focus it on our ports, very important to me. I'm just voicing an opinion. I know we've had this discussion. I know others have seen my comments, but also on the on on the water side of things, yeah, there's scurf funding or whatever, but. It's, such that the legislature understands when we get in front of them the insufficiencies that we have in development of channels 
uh, from a funding standpoint, but also in the support needed for maintaining these channels. So, you know, we, I don't know what really, you know, this is very, very high level, I think, and, and I would contend that, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, uh, investments that the, uh, that the legislature uh, passed and text on it were very appreciative of of some of the uh, funding that we received to encourage our um, uh, construction of facilities inside the gate. I, I get that. I think we need to highlight the very much reports, and I'm speaking for Port Houston, which you know, uh, you know, is is a big and growing port, and to highlight and put emphasis on the needs for transportation on the water side and the land side of the port should be stressed in what our interim charge is going forward. But that, that's opinion. I know you can't write everything in here, but I don't know that we're capturing the essence of the economic value that these ports uh, you know, providing to the state of Texas and the need uh, for construction of infrastructure investments, as it says in the, in the transportation cut in connection with maritime port transportation or economic development. So I just want to make sure that we're not highlighting, uh, you know, just port facility projects. And that's been my point, <laughs> I understand. Uh, you know, the, 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 the dredging is important. I know there's a loan program that really hadn't been uh, a part of, uh, people hadn't taken advantage of. And, uh, you know, I, I think we just need to continue to highlight that because demands are continuing to grow through all of our ports and making sure that we have uh, the ability to uh, get to and from our ports for efficient commerce, I think, is important. I think it's something that the legislature, as well as Textile, needs to put their arms around. And we, you know, we're Port Authority Advisory Committee under the Maritime Division of Textile. That's the point I want to make. I think we should include more in that. Uh, and again, uh, analyzing the state's recent investments, where we ask them to analyze. Yes, I, I, I agree with that. Definitely. Not necessarily so far on on that. Yeah, to have much analysis at this point. So, so anyway, th those are my opinions. I feel strongly about them, and, uh, and th that's just my opinion. Just to recap that, I, I kind of understand the thought of position on analyze it because we don't have that much to analyze it, and also with the inclusion of some wording like sport connectivity projects or something like that as well. Rogers satisfied, or do you think it needs to go more in depth? Because I do understand we want to do inside and outside gate project. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms like, you know, progressing the inland freight mobility for all of our ports. I mean, I think that's, that's important. You know, and, and you know, I, I don't believe that I'm alone. And, you know, I know other ports, uh, yes, we're a big container port. We've got a lot of trucks going in on the freight network or whatever. And we, we can't inhibit that, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, there's certainly, and no matter what kind of port it is, you know, I, I know, I'm not gonna speak for Roger, but we gotta, we gotta make sure there's next dot investment to infrastructure to and from cruise terminals as well. You know, and so um, I just think we need to highlight that those infrastructure needs so they don't get the opinion that it's just talking about building wharfs and docks. So, and, and, and we've been around here for a while, and you know, I believe everyone knows that they were supportive of projects inside the gate, that, but also we can't, you know, we, we can't diminish the need what the access from the land side and the water side. Anyway, that's an opinion. <laughs>
Well, I know when we when we only fund looking at outside stuff, I would always look at opinion should do both, and I'm still of the opinion should do both. And your point right directly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, go because what we're looking at is the integration of the port system into the transportation. Absolutely. Uh, nothing stays before the port. Something is really wrong. Let's so, hope it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, so it goes in and out. So, and that's why we started looking at the, the wayfinding, expanding that, looking at the high and heavy corridors to try to expand that. So we can really get a true picture of, of, of how the cargo moves into the city. So that is definitely at the forefront of what we're focusing on. That's one of the issues for our Arlington's dealing with is the connectivity of the cargo from its ports into, you know, and as well as international trade. So I think that, yes, it needs to be more encompassing of um, the connectivity from the ports as well. So. I think Chapter 55 is both type part of all of it. Yeah. yeah. I know. See how maybe that needs to be incorporated in line with this or any other topic. Are we today? Are we looking to bring this and the right discussions and walk away with a you know, charge that we all agree on, um, or not? Well, I. I think access, obviously, I, I think I, it's not in here. No, I, I think, though, I mean, we could mm -hmm. obviously be here all day doing that, too. But, you know, I, I, I know we, there, there was an attempt to put this forward through the EPA and uh, a lot of discussion about it. I mean, uh, I offered some wording originally that included port facilities, you know, investments in port facilities, as well as in, in uh, inland freight mobility to you know to mm -hmm. tag on to support international trade i think that's you know we got to recognize that texas is dependent on the economy in texas is dependent on international trade so we got to support that we've got to get that on the radar for that infrastructure the highways multimodal whatever that may be um, but as well as no navigation improvements. Do you have that word handy? Yeah, where we can have somebody maybe. Uh, yeah, I've submitted it to the TPA. Yeah, uh, but anyway, we've got. Yeah. Man, I think they merged and stuff. Yeah. So anyway, that, that, that's that, that's an opinion. And um, anyway, and I use the word examine investments needed. Okay. So, I got that. I got that. Okay. I'm not trying to no, no. Do oppose my will or whatever. I just think there's things that if we're going to submit an interim charge, we need to highlight the things that need to be reviewed for kind of funding. I think the outside the bill should be highlighted as well. How detailed we describe it is just. Is the secondary question I do think should be in there. Uh, one other bit of feedback I think I heard is that on the when we talk about the definition, we say Texas, and this says Texas commercial ports and says cruise and cargo ports. That might be a little repetitive because I think in commercial ports it's already covered, so there's not a need to identify specifically cruise and cargo ports. That may kind of muddy. I think it does. I think it's distracting because you're trying to understand it, and it doesn't exactly. I mean, TPA presented, and I think was a, you know was approved a definition of Texas maritime ports, and this is not consistent with that definition. So, um, not that this body has to worry about TPA's definition, but but I think there is a definition out there, and it doesn't have to be. We just don't have to work so hard to try to make sure everybody's specifically included. I think. We've got our 23 ports. We know what their cargo movements are, and um, we just need to refer to them as the Texas Maritime ports. Uh, well, every every port, every port has port facility needs. They have access needs from the land side. They have access needs from the water side. And 
think highlighting those. Do you believe that the commercial sea boards is inclusive enough of all boards? That was not because I added No, no, I get it. And, and that's in, uh, that's in the chapter 55 cruise and cargo. My point is uh, commercial seaports, uh, you know, where, where are you going to stop? You know, I mean, there's three yeah. different levels handling all types of cargoes. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I think, I do think commercial seaports. Mm -hmm. Encompasses that, Roger, but you know, not to discredit crews, but if where do you where do you stop? Cargo, marinas, uh, you know, bulk facilities. This is a certain commercial activity. Yeah, but um, <laughs> so anyway, those are my thoughts. So. Uh, I think it goes to what do we want out of this? I mean, that's that's what's really important. You know, do we, we need to make sure that it is comprehensive enough that it gives us information to work with in, in the next legislative session. We don't want it to be too narrowly focused. I know, uh, Aaron, I know you you kind of also initiated some of this discussion, and we'd certainly appreciate uh, your thoughts and input on kind of what the legislature would be looking for for you know, sure. charge. Because that's part of what we're doing is kind of responding to what we think will, will yeah. have uh, advisory input into what will be considered. So well that's right. That's right. And thank you. Uh, and thank you everybody for all y'all's hard work on this. You know, when I first brought this up, the only reason why I did because at the end of the day, the lieutenant governor and his staff, me, we're gonna write it. OK, and as Phyllis just said, what do we want out of it? I thought because I get to where I'm in a very unique situation in that I'm the lieutenant governor's transportation policy advisor, but I'm also a PAC member. OK, and so what I thought was, hey, you know what, if I'm going to write this charge, because, again, other senators have already submitted me, you know, that they want to look at this issue. But I thought, you know what, I'll reach out, you know, and, and ask my fellow PAC members. I'm going to write it, so why don't y'all help me write it? And that's that was the goal. Um, you know, uh, obviously things are not as easy as I think they should be, um, <laughs> but that's a good thing. But that's a that's okay because you know we're all learning from this, and I think y'all are being educated on what the legislature actually does between legislative sessions and how we study issues, so that when we go to the next session you know, we're educated and we're that much further ahead on these issues. And so, like I said, I mean, you know, you're not, as a PAC member, I can see where there are some people who just want to look at additional funding, you know, but the fact of the matter is the legislature is going to want to look at the recent investments, okay? And y'all are talking about outside the gate projects. Well, guess what? To me, that's a recent investment. That's $40 million of the mobility fund. So the legislature probably would have been happy to hear about those investments and how those outside the gate projects are going. So the bottom line is, in other words, what I was just trying to do is, again, as Phyllis said, you know, what what would the PAC want out of it? What would TPA want out of it? In other words, we're supposed to be all in this together, you know, working, you know, as folks who are proponents of all Texas ports. And so, you know, what this interim charge is, is just a, um, you know, it, it, it gives us uh, an opportunity to tell our story so that we are better well positioned moving into the 2025 session. Um, you know, I like I said, I, I think there may be those who are complicating this when that, that's not necessary. Because like I said, at the end of the day, if we don't do anything, I'm going to write it anyway. So what I wanted was TPA and the PAC to help me tell me what it is that y'all want to look at. What do we need to look at? What do we need to talk about? How can we tell this wonderful story about what the PAC, or I'm sorry, what the ports have done with the funding 
and what we will do with additional funding if there would be another appropriation next session. So I don't know, Chris, if that helped or did I just complicate things even more? Uh, that 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 helps and and um, kind of appreciate that call because that's that outlines why we're here discussing this item anyway to have our input into uh, what maybe the interim charges may look like. Yeah, so uh, yeah, appreciate that, Aaron. So if I may, thank thank you, Aaron and. And sorry for making it complicated. No, no, no. But, no but, but as a PAC member and the foremost person that knows what really needs, I, I hope you appreciate all of our comments. Absolutely, absolutely. This is this is very very helpful. And and you know from that, you know I, I'll I'll just say I I think you're probably more well versed to put this in words than us sitting around here all day long. But I mean, you've heard my comments, you've heard some other comments. I'm okay with that. Because, yeah. but no, I, mean, just, the, the, I want to highlight to make sure we're understanding the concerns. And granted, you know, sitting on the, the TxDOT Freight Advisory Committee, that kind of melds over into some of the concerns about freight transportation, you know, inland transportation as well, Aaron. So I sure, get that. Sure. But uh, anyway, so those are my comments. I'm not going to try to rewrite it here or whatever. I yeah. certainly. Personally, you know, I, I, I'm no, the, right. Yeah, no, and trust me when I say, yeah, the thoughtfulness, the thoroughness, I mean, it is evident. It is very evident, and it is it is very much appreciated. Um, you know, I just, I, I don't want it to cause a problem moving forward, and so um, basically, you know, that that's that's where I was going with this. And I, and I, I really don't think it, it is. I think all the comments have been have been very good. I don't know if we try to try to work out uh, something to submit this, or it's a it's a table item. But one thing, perhaps, only just some thoughts. If we examine the states, and if we if we take out recent investments and just say investments, that includes recent investments and future investments, perhaps, uh, and then. Uh, the cruise and cargo ports are a little repetitive. That was taken out. And then we add somewhere in here uh, freight connectivity or something like that, or port connectivity that, that Rogers actually is, I guess, pretty close to at least putting something together that, that Aaron can look at or our legislators can look at. Can this charge also include investments that have been? In previous, like brighter 45, brighter 38. Brighter I think it's going to look at be past it because I mean, from my standpoint, the investments that have been made since 2017 into the Port of Arlington have been significant and have allowed us to uh, really continue to grow and be able to take advantage of opportunities. And I think that's as long as we're not just looking at, because one of my concerns about the recent investments is the just how a lot of these projects aren't going to really be in. We're not going to know what um, what the benefits of those projects are just yet because they're going to be in construction or still in the in the design phase or whatever the case may be. But if we're also looking back at the rider projects that have been done. I think that's something that should be included in this interim charge as well, and not just the recent investments that have been done, uh, you know, in this past legislative session. Yeah, and, and, and specifically highlighting future needed investments for the transportation system, I think is important. And I think we'll miss an opportunity if we don't highlight what the state's investments are complementing, because that's not all we're doing. You know, we're we're investing, and then it's helping to make our other investments produce greater economic benefits and faster. So, if we don't tell that story or include that in a study like this, then we're missing an opportunity. True. 
Aaron, do you feel like that that's fair to include the past investments that have been done? Absolutely. That's why I said investments. So you, know, you could look at past and future investments. If we take out the recent word, just say investments, maybe examine the state's investments in Texas commercial seaports, navigation districts, and examine the investment funding needed to support connectivity and international trade, or some, some wording in there that, it, uh, that makes it really the overall encompassing what ports do. So I'm not sure how that last bit of wording, I don't have that in my head yet. So. <laughs> Roger, do you have any idea where we might have put forth some wording in that? To have got a, I guess it's not mandatory that we that we come up with something. We could just tailor it and say, hey, we, 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 we're on record and we have the minutes now of what our thoughts are for the interim charges. Because like Aaron said, we're not actually going to be a drafter of in, uh, the interim charges. We're just revised. So. What is the time frame in which this has to be submitted? <laughs> So the lieutenant governor gave the, uh, the senators a February 15th deadline. <laughs> well, let me ask a question there. Is this not, I mean, it can't be all encompassing. I understand that, but is it not a measure whereby, you know, having a charge that ultimately there's a committee where we can be able to get in front of to more uh, widely express some of these that we're talking about today. Is that is that the intent? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, in other words, like I said, this is just, you know, it is, it's an issue that the legislature wants to look at moving into next session and then you know, when the chair holds their hearing on this issue, then of course, you know, you can testify, um, you know, on, on any related subject, you know, as it relates to this particular issue. So I you can- have a, I think we do have a question online from, from Becky Hewlett. Uh, Becky, I recognize you. Good morning. Um, I am the deputy general counsel here at TxDOT, and I just wanted to weigh in on this issue and make sure that we're all understanding the role of the committee and how we would go about doing any kind of suggestions to the legislature. As a state agency and as a committee developed for the state by the state agency to handle, I don't want you to go outside your scope of what you can do. This discussion is all fine. But if you vote on this recommendation, it's going to have to run through. It's, it would be directed to the department and to text on it. It would have to run through the agency. You couldn't submit directly to the legislature. Aaron being on the committee, of course, he can take all this information and this discussion and the things he's learned and heard from y'all and develop something on the senator's behalf. But if if the you vote on this as a whole, it has to come to the um, to text dot. So we'd have to go through gear and all of that to be submitted. And I, due to the time frame, I don't think you're going to have time to get through all of that. So um, I just wanted to make sure that you understood that when you did vote on it, it would be something that would be submitted to text dot, not directly to the legislature. Becky, I appreciate that very much. Actually, when when Mr. Koshian brought this to me, I thought it was more of a matter for TPA. Uh, as well. So I'm fine if we table or we pass this item and, and don't address it and leave that to DPA. And uh, Mr. Goshen's kind of heard just thoughts of what courts are in general. And that way we're not uh, in the position of, of specifying you know, charges from the time. Yeah. yeah, he can take everything that he's heard today and, and draft it into something that the senator can use. Just not, you know, if you put forth something specific and say this is for that, it it would need to run through text. I like it. Perfect. I like it. Thank you, Aaron. Thank so, you. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank y'all. Thank y'all. Do we have a maybe I'll ask for a motion to just table this item or not address it or say it's maybe why don't you put it up for a vote and then it doesn't get any okay. second. All right. I'll, I'll ask, is there a motion to approve the language 
the men in our ass discuss. Do not have a motion. Is there any public comment? Do not have a, uh, any public comment, so this motion fails. So we'll go on to the next item. And I certainly appreciate Becky's uh, input on that. Legal counsel, that's, that's very good. That clarifies that item. But uh, I did have some questions on it anyway. So, very good. Okay. Item number 10, presentation and update on the 2026-2027 Port Mission Plan. Thank you. Thank you, Larry Squires. I'm a Cosumbia of the Econ. I'm the A Econ project manager for the 2026-2027 Port Mission Plan. Um, Eric Couple is the B Tech Project Manager for the Port. Um, so most of y'all familiar with the Port Mission Plan, a um, biannual plan that the PAP is required to put out through the uh, Chapter 5 of the Transition Group. Um, I just here to give an overview of the newest version of the plan and where we are in the process. Um, overall, the structure is staying the same for the report, so there will be one in the overall Port Mission Plan and it will contain three sections within it, um, the first being maritime infrastructure for any of the products that the um, seaport connectivity for the outside the gate, and then ship channel for any new channel that we have The ports that are included, there are 20 of the 23 process ports that will be in the port mission plan. Um, we highlighted in blue the three ports that are new for this iteration of the plan. Um, so the Grand Canyon Navigation District, CEO Port, and Chilios North County Nav District. Um, we're already well into the process of developing the plan, so um, big thank you to all of you who have had those round interviews with um, almost everyone on this list. One was had uh, a little bit later, so we're still waiting on that uh, first interview, but we held those in September through December of last year, um, and we used those to get kind of initial project um, information and just updates on what's happening in your boards. Um, um, we're excited to share that the Port Mission Plan is getting a new look. So um, we've developed some, uh, hopefully a look and feel that will make the plan a little bit more uh, easily digestible. Um, we'll be kind of engaging to the reader, easy to pick up uh, and understand what's happening. We also updated the maps. They're a little bit brighter and hopefully we'll kind of draw attention to what's in the Port Mission Plan itself. Um, we're updating the Port profiles. So originally these were developed in 2022. They were a standalone effort from the Port Mission Plan. Um, I think there were some previous versions as well, but um, the one in the background is the older version. They are available still in that older format on the um, website. Um, we're going to be including them in the Port Mission Plan during this iteration. And so we're updating the look and feel of these to be more in line with the plan itself. Uh, these will be something that we'll be providing to all the ports for your review before they are finalized and published. Um, so you'll have a chance to look through all the information and make sure it's up to date. Um, there's a paragraph that describes your priorities and opportunities. We want to make sure that, that says what you want it to say. Um, so once we uh, finalize these on our side, we'll send them to all the ports. That will be probably in the late spring, early summer time frame. So you'll be able to start looking at those documents. Along with um, those port profiles, we're developing new legislative cover pages. So these have not existed before through the Port Mission Plan. Um, and what they are is they will be a resource guide for each of the uh, state and U.S. representatives. Um, and so they'll they'll be they will have um, their own sheet that shows the ports in their district as well as any of the projects that are put into the Port Mission Plan within. Um, so it'll be an easy way for a legislator to look at the priorities in your area and their own gene and abilities as well. So we just don't have a format, but they will they will be available online in addition to those four profiles. Um, the last thing here just about the kind of look and feel of the plan. Um, so we're developing project profiles similar to task port mission plans. Um, any of the projects that are submitted for the port mission plan will be put into a project profile will be something like this. Um, we'll be using kind of graphics and photos that we have with rendering for photos of 
within the project that you'd like to share. Um, those can be included on there. Um, these will also be available for court review. So the courts will have a chance to look at what's been included and make sure that the language and the content on there is as you would like it to uh, be shown. Um, projects do need to be in the formation plan for the pack to select them for future funding. So it's in the best interest to um, submit the projects that are eligible and um, and help us to make those work for many more. Um, those will also be available in the late spring and early summer time frame for the court. Um, related to that, we have sent out uh, some project questionnaires. These are allowing us to get more detailed information about the projects that we learned about from you during those first round interviews. Um, so the Maritime Infrastructure Project questionnaires, these were sent out in the middle of January. Um, a lot of the boards have already submitted them back to us. So thank you for doing that. Please, uh, just a reminder to complete the questionnaires if you haven't already. Um, just provide as much information for the projects that is available, um, and that'll help us to develop the project profiles, and it'll also use information that um, that's not maritime will be able to have on file. Um, the hope is eventually to make that all electronic, so in the future years, uh, look for more um, easier ways to fill that out. Um, if you have any GIS shape files um, of the projects or your work batteries, those will also be helpful to us if we're developing the maps that will be going into um, the project profiles. And the um, you will also be receiving questionnaires for projects for super connectivity and the channel. Um, for super connectivity, I believe are getting up today, so um, you will be receiving them shortly. Um, it, they look very similar in style to the other questionnaires that we're seeing in the same, same story. Just fill out as much as information as you're available or that is available for the project at the moment um, to help us develop those profiles. Um, we're also developing these maps for the connectivity projects. So we will look at things like crash density, um, your grade rail crossings, things like that. Um, our transportation engineers are performing an analysis of various that might be choke points or, or dangerous. Um, and so those will be provided for just general um, information and knowledge as they're related to the projects that you're going to. Um, Friendship Channel, those projects are divided into federal and non federal. Um, so, this is the distinction of the right to remind you. Uh, so, federal are the projects that are going through the word of process of the right to federal authorization. Um, non federal projects are your review work projects that are not going through a word of process or uh, uh, federal authorization. Um, at this time, we're not including the maintenance projects as standalone projects within the plan. Um, we have tried to capture some of the maintenance fees for the ports because we know that that's a big issue. Um, those will be described in the narrative of the plan, but not in the uh, project profiles. Um, those questionnaires will be coming out in mid February, um, and that will they'll be in a similar format. And um, they have already been populated. I should mention this: all of the questionnaires have been populated with the information that we have to date on your projects. So we can um, either just update that information or providing new information information is no longer. As far as the schedule for the rest of the port mission plan, um, so as I mentioned, we did complete the first round of interviews with ports last year. So thank you again for helping us do that. We're currently working on sending you all the questionnaires. So we've already sent out the American infrastructure ones. We'll be sending out seaport connectivity and ship channel today and then in a couple of weeks. Um, and then around uh, late spring, early summer, so that's the May, June time frame, we'll have all of the materials in draft format for you to look at and review um, for all of your projects and your profiles. Um, in the, later in the summer, in June or July, we'll offer a second round of interviews if you would like to be on the phone with us to talk through your materials, not additional projects, um, you know, walk through something we want changed. Um, we can do all of that in a second interview. Um, and then in August or October, so into the fall, that's when the package will be final information. Um, so next steps, we're working on developing um, the content for the report um, for the plan in general. Uh, submit your questionnaires as they come in. Um, they will come in three separate patches to kind of keep them distinct. Um, and we will send future communications for when the materials are ready. 
And please feel free to contact me or Taylor or anyone um, if you have questions or you need help with the questionnaires, anything. We're available to set up a quick meeting and go over that with you. So, yeah, I think you're done. Um, and some of the communications will have come from Paul Way, who is uh, our self consultancy AD Cog, and helping with our communications on this project. So, they're also involved. And I think that the, the questionnaires came out last night. Are they going last night? Yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. so, so, am I? Yeah. We had trouble with the folder, so we're getting out this year. I do have a quick. So during the second interview portion, did you need an update in your questionnaire information that you submitted? You'll be able to allow us to submit updates to that. Yes. So I'm the second interview part. Or, or add a new project that came up. Oh, okay. Excellent. Okay. Yes. That's very good to keep it fresh. Yeah, sure. No, I think that's good. I think what we heard last go around was that there was like sort of these projects had a shelf life and boards are very fluid and move very quickly. And if we're acting on information that we received, Months ago, it's it's a struggle. I think this is I think it's a very good approach. Allows you to get the bulk of the information compiled for the for the port mission plan, but then allows you to update. So, is there any other questions of the thing? Thank y'all very much. Appreciate it. Okay, item 11 is presentation and update on the container on barge feasibility study. Jim? Just give me a little bit. I am Jim Cruz with the Texas a and Transportation. And I had the Center for Ports and Waterways. Um, what I want to present to you today is a high level view. I'm not, I don't have a lot of details, but I have findings to present to you. But a high level view of what the Container on Barge Feasibility Study is and where it's going. And I will say that at any point in time you want to talk to me to provide information or get questions or concerns, please do it at any point. And we, we need information. It's hard to come by in many cases. Let me, uh, let me just kind of quickly run through what we're doing. The first, um, instead of giving you a scope of work, I like what questions are we going to answer? I think that's more relevant than the scope of work. So what are the questions we're trying to answer? Is there enough traffic to justify a container on barge system in Texas? Container traffic. Do ports have and are they willing to acquire the new equipment? If, it, if the volume looks reasonable, do we have the facilities to do it? Second question. The third was, can, can this service be competitive on cost and service? You know, service characteristics, delivery times, transit times, so forth, schedules. And then where's the optimal location for that connection to happen to the ocean system? So, because obviously it's the exports and import items that you're going by container. So that's what we're looking at. Now, that being said, the way the project is structured, in order to avoid going down a rabbit hole and just spending a lot of money, yeah. we're gonna stop at the first question, is there enough traffic here? We're gonna sit down, with what we've learned and present the text on what we have found and decide whether the rest of the study ought to be done or whether we ought to just trash and we're throwing good money after bad. So that, that's the way the project is structured. My initial findings are that we'll probably move past that for a but I'm not gonna, I'm not, don't hold me to that because we haven't gotten that far yet. What we did initially was just to get the lay of the land, we sent a traffic survey out or initial survey out to 13 different ports. And these are the 13 ports were selected just based on prior communication, where we had a record that they were interested in following up on container and barge activity. So that's that's where these went. Of the 13 that we sent out, we got 11 responses, which is just absolutely phenomenal. I understand we're about to get a 12. So 12 out of 13 for any kind of a survey is just unheard of. But that's the kind of the level of interest we've got from the ports. So the, gen the general questions about what do you know about container on barge? What kind of stuff's moving through your area that could use it? What impact did this have on your development? Those kinds of questions. The details will come later, but right now we just want to understand where you are and your thinking and where each port is and their, their ideas. Um, problem here. Can't see what I got. Thank you. Um, 
What we did in addition to the surveys, we actually had a couple of, well, I say a couple, we had several conversations. One with a major industrial corporation who's actually gone through this process on their own. That's all I can tell you. I'm not, I'm not at liberty to discuss who they are, where they are, or what they said because I have an, an NDA with them, a non disclosure agreement. But it was very helpful in understanding what shippers want and what's important to them and what might hold us back. So that was very good. We've also got some uh, documentation from a Rio Grande Valley customs broker who tried to do this several years back and what he learned when he tried to do it. So that's also valid on the ground information. Then we've had follow up conversations already with three ports. And hopefully we'll have some more as you know as you all think about this and see what's going on. We'd love to have these conversations with you. So the first step, and I just want to explain to you what it is we're doing. If you look at the flow of containers in Texas, the target, I'm going to say the target of the potential market for container on barge is those containers going up and down the coast right now that could conceivably, instead of going by truck, go by barge. That's the whole point, right? So what we're doing is we're taking your current container handling facility, of course, the port of Houston, the Southern Galveston, and the Southern Freeport. So we're, we're kind of carving that out and we're saying, what's going from these port areas to and from this container area that could possibly divert, be diverted to water and not have to go by truck? To do that, there is no such information available, as I tell you right up front. Every time you do a freight study, you find all the things you, don't, you can't get and don't know. But what we have learned is that we can get the flow of commodities, very specific commodities, from one port area to another, not the port itself, but the area around. So we've gotten that, that data set, that's transfer data set. Then we're going to use the period data set to look at what does move by container in and out of these ports. So we can determine how much of this transfer data really would, would be expected to move by container and provide the market. And that's, that's the process we're in right now. And that will, to a large part, determine what we tell TxDOT when we get to the stop point or to the, the, the decision point. So the decision point, we have to come up with a volume idea, an idea of the volume, an idea of destinations for this cargo, the cargo type. And I didn't put this on there, but I would say the, the willingness to participate and make this happen on the part of either private industry or port authorities. So let's, let's assume there's a go. Let's see, let's see if we get past this first point. We say, yeah, there's enough interest. Let, let's move forward. Then we have to do certain specific things. Now, we're not going to try to develop the container on barge service. We're just, that's not what we're doing. That's done by an operator. What we are trying to do is figure out the feasibility. Would an operator be interested in doing this given what we've learned? And so we're going to document that. We'll look at the applicable cost elements that, that apply to container on barge movements. We'll look at pro forma shipping costs, how barge would compare to truck for these specific movements we're looking at. We'll do another survey of port users to find out what kind of equipment are you planning to put on your site? Or what could you simply put on your site that would manage this traffic? If it were to, to become a, a new a node on this on the network at your port. And of course, we'll issue a final report that documents everything we've been through and all the discussions that we've had. The first decision point will be April 1, so it's like six weeks out. We will sit down and say, okay, is, should we proceed with the rest of the study or not? That's where we are. Uh, again, my early indications are we probably will, but I'm not going to guarantee that until we actually have the data in hand. The final report. Wrap it all up, final report, all, all documented, would be October 31st. At that point, then it would be up to industry or port authorities, whoever, to take this and say, okay, we've got enough information now that we can push this forward and make it happen. That's the idea. So with that, I'm going to stop right there. I try to, want to keep a high level. We don't have findings to give you, but we have you know, things we're looking at. So again, if you have questions right now, if you haven't answered them, but also if you, have, if you want to have a detailed discussion with me, Please feel free to call me and let's have that. I, I need all the information I can give. Space, Jim, any questions, Jim? I think it's important to highlight that one, one already has it. I have to sell it. He was concerned about you know, right, right. I'm sorry. The, the first point is there enough traffic, but I think what determines that. They get a yes or no center major is, you know, it's a chicken or the egg. It's the cost. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's there's boxes that can go by a truck, but, you know, if if it's never going to be, and, and I'm not saying it is or isn't, but if it's not going to be cheaper and faster to go by barge, then you may get to that decision center than later. 
Right. Well, I mean, I, I know you have to move. Yeah, I follow you. I follow you. Part of, part of the thinking is there has to be enough volume that's even worth having. If cost, cost can kill any volume you come up with, so cost is the critical element to make it go forward. But if you don't have enough volume to even consider anything would work, then there's no point in forward with that either. So it's, it's kind of a two step approach. It's, and just make sure we're not talking about it's the handling only chance. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, sure. It's if it went by truck, what you have to do door to door, and if it goes by parts, what you have to do door to door. That's yeah, kind of how it's going to have to be. And you're you're going to be eliminating the costs of those. Yes. Right. So the yeah. other idea would be to see what that differential is. Yes. Do you know some indications that we got from some industry are that it, it can work? It can work, but again, there has to be enough volume that it's even worth considering it. Nobody that's going to try to start start a business, you know, move to ten thousand a year. It, it just got to have something to work with. So that's what we're looking at. That that's a valid point. Cost does determine the actual ability to move this project forward, not this concept forward. That will be done in detail. Definitely. Okay. Question you here. Right, thank you, Jim. Appreciate that. Item number 12, presentation on freight and supply chain resiliency plan. For introductory purposes, my name is Andrew Cannon. I'm the Director of Trade, Freight, and Connectivity Planning at TxDOT. Uh, fairly new to the position, been here for 97 days. Not that anybody's counting. <laughs> uh, served for 20 years as the Executive Director for an MPO in the Valley. Before this, and I circled back around because I was at TPMP before I did that. So, came right back home to roost. A lot of the conversations that you're having here today are pretty exciting from the standpoint that what we do at FTC uh, is provide staff support uh, to so much that's what you're discussing today. We have the Board of Trade Advisory Committee and chaired by Jane Nelson that we provide staff support and guidance on the meeting next week in El Paso. Uh, if you have to on here, please join us. Uh, of course, we also have the Texas Freight Advisory Committee chaired by Judge Ed Emmett. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. And then, I'm sorry. And then in our connectivity section, um, several corridors, plus planes I-27, I-14, that we're all looking at that and trying to see how can we get freight people goods safely, efficiently, and quickly from point A to point B. So a lot of the conversation that you're having to hear is uh, right in line with that. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I'll try to keep this brief. I'm also trying to get used to my uh, <clears throat> in bifocals. So please bear with me on that. That's a humbling thing in itself to say. So I'm here today. Uh, I'm only 56. I don't know where I am. Uh, the Texas Freight and Supply Chain Plan or Resiliency Plan. Uh, this is a complement to the statewide resiliency plan that is underway. Uh, we actually just had our kickoff with this with Cambridge Systematics, who is our consultant on board to get this going. And uh, I'll try to talk to you a little bit about the background, purpose, overview, the alignment with maritime, and then the uh, statewide engagement opportunities, which will, of course, include many here from today that we'll be seeing that feedback from. So, what is freight resiliency? Um, in a nutshell, it's the anticipating, prepare for, and adapt for changing conditions. Uh, we look at that as many factors from being COVID, of course, had a definite impact on the supply chain and how we did business, hurricanes, um, winter events, uh, and other man-made situations that can happen uh, in the geopolitical realm out there and then cyber attacks. So we try to be very mindful of that, and that's what we're trying to prepare for, uh, I guess, as much as anybody can prepare for. Uh, in these situations and uh, uh, be ready to go with that. And it's also to uh, um, impact the six uh, key industry supply chains, uh, manufacturing, 
for the automotive and electronic uh, supply chain, and then of course the agriculture, construction, petroleum, and warehousing supply chain. So we're trying to encompass all of those supply chains that there's a plan uh, to work with us and provide some information back to them as uh, feedback as well. So as a part of this, it stems out from our Texas Delivers 2015 uh, policy plans, our plan that we have and the action taken from that. And it's to develop a statewide supply chain and multimodal freight network resiliency enhancement plan to address input uh, and dis of disruptions. Um, so we are moving forward with that diligently. And as I said in the beginning, this is the complement statewide plan uh, that is now under. So, of course, looking back, uh, one of the things that we're looking at is impacts that we did have from COVID-19 so supply chain. And I, I know I'm speaking to the choir here uh, when we're talking about that. People here are much more mindful of the situations that happen. Um, and I know that uh, uh, Mr. Gunther is sitting on text back, uh, which I was also a member of. It gives a different perspective. Of, I served on there in a different hat before now. Um, he was aware about the impacts of that at the tech track meeting. Uh, my staff has here August of 2021 uh, about how it's, the supply chain was just broken by COVID-19 aspects of workforce operations costs uh, and operating budgets. So hopefully COVID is behind us, but it's one of those things, the pandemics that we're looking into and make, trying to make ourselves aware of and prepared. And of course, for a few that we have Big problem with queuing a vessel, uh, getting that address, and then Port of Galveston declined in bulk liquids. And Victoria had a 17% drop in total tonnage in April 2020. So these are the type of endeavors that we're looking at and trying to find ways to help around if you will. So, and then the winter storm Yuri, uh, which is a new one for me. Uh, I never knew we needed winter storms. Uh, when I was a kid, it was 1984 or whatever, so now we have new storms. Uh, but definitely looking at that because that was a big one. I mean, even all the way down to the valley when I was living there for, uh, at that time, I had people in our neighborhoods that were without power for a week. And we're talking South Texas where that is very rare to ever happen. Uh, so it did have an impact all the way down the coastline. Ports had to cease on what they were doing at the terminals in some cases and operations. And how do you get the trucks back and forth when the roads are so iced over in the situation that we had with that ice storm that we're unable to move those goods in or out of the port situations? And then, of course, Hurricane Harvey. Hurricanes are nothing new to the coastline. I uh, haven't been born and raised here in Houston. I'm certainly aware and mindful of the impacts of hurricanes that they have upon us. Uh, they shut down the ports. So uh, workforce are unable to get back and forth. Uh, to the ports to access them and do uh, what's needed road conditions to now provide opportunities for the workforce to get back and forth, much less moving uh, the goods and commodities to and from the port. And then uh, uh, in Hurricane Harvey, Port of Galveston lost three vessels. Um, so we had major food production um, diversions over into Florida at the Port of Manatee. And that definitely has a cost that's associated to that that impacts all of us. And then the I-45 flooding, uh, which hasn't changed since I was a baby. It's unfortunate, but we're trying to find ways around it. Uh, the project approach, I'm not going to read every one of these to you, but you know the big ones for here is supply chain resiliency, freight resiliency. How can we look at that? How can we keep those commodities and those goods from back and forth with as minimal an impact from the conditions that are happening uh, upon that situation? And then, of course, port connectivity issue. Our state long range plan, our freight plan, help identify these needs. Hopefully, it's something that we're doing off of the new Texas Freight Advisory Committee. Uh, we will be working on a new update to that Freight Advisory Committee, as well as make sure we hope to be uh, if we can the Freight Advisory Committee, which also has impacts to and from many of the ports as well with the commodity trades that we have with Mexico moving back and forth. Uh, we, we know that times have changed. For instance, when we adopted our Border Trade Advisory Committee, we had yet had COVID-19. So we know that we have definite impacts and degrees of variation that we need to look at that with those updates 
and we certainly will be engaging with many of the stakeholders in the room today to try to get feedback as we try to supplement those plans and feed into better data uh, so we have better outcomes from those plans. So and these are some of the key questions that our consultants will be visiting with you wanting to find out, you know, what are the impacts, what are the disruptions, how can we go about uh, minimizing disruptions, and what can TxDOT do to align? I think that goes right back to the conversation we were having here uh, just a few minutes ago. How can TxDOT, how can we work collectively with you to align into what your goals are and what our goals are as a statewide agency into moving that commodity, that, that freight into and out of the port area, as well as just making sure the economic vitality of the area and the state growing and moving forward and keeping our passenger vehicle operators out there safe in the process as well. We have, we have a large impact on passenger vehicle operators as we move more and more freight uh, down the highway. This is our timeline. Uh, as you can see, just right there, we kicked off here in 2024. Uh, I think we have a pretty good amount of public engagement opportunities uh, and uh, professional engagement opportunities that we will be asking, sending out information and asking for your engagement as we work with our consultants to prepare the consistency plan and get ready to submit it to the administration uh, for review and hope, hopeful adoption of this piece. As we wrap this up in uh, 2025, mm -hmm. uh, that was very quick and expedited. I don't want to. Take up much of your time, but if there's any questions, we can already answer those as much as I can. Thank you. Is there Thank any you. questions uh, for Andrew or any comments regarding Andrew's presentation? No questions. Good question. Thank you very much. Appreciate that very much. Item number 13. Uh, General public comments. So, if we have any comments from the public, and please, if you have any comments, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Your comments. Hearing no comments, but item 14, which is adjourned. So, do we have a? Do we have a motion to adjourn? Moved. Moved by Walter Smith. Second. I second. Second by Mr. Duncan. Is there any public comments regarding uh, uh, our presentation of the So, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank y'all very much. Appreciate it. So, the vote here is not until 1 30. I don't know.